Hi everyone, welcome to this lecture covering chapter 13. We're going to talk about the blood. The blood is a tissue. It's not neural, it's not epithelial or muscular, but blood is considered connective tissue. And it's not just a red liquid that looks like Kool-Aid. It's actually made up of many different components. So do you know what a centrifuge is? So basically a centrifuge is a machine that spins specimens or material so fast that centrifugal force actually allows different density parts to separate out. So if you were to spin a sample of blood in a centrifuge, these components would separate out and then you could identify them. So this image is basically what it would look like after centrifugation. The largest component, making up about 55% of blood, is our plasma. This is mostly water, but it also contains proteins, nutrients, electrolytes, hormones, and gases. The proteins in plasma play a big part in clotting, which we'll talk about in a bit. And if you were to actually remove those proteins, it would be known as what, um, known as plasma serum. The next largest component, making up about 45% of the blood, is the formed elements. So this includes red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes. It includes white blood cells, also called leukocytes. And lastly, it includes platelets. Red blood cells are heavy, which is why they sink to the bottom when blood is spun in a centrifuge. If you were to calculate the percentage of red blood cells you have in your body, it would be known as what is your hematocrit. Typically, those acclimated to altitude will have a higher hematocrit than those at lower altitudes or unacclimated. The white blood cells and the platelets also separate out from, uh, from other formed elements, and they aren't as heavy as the red blood cells, but they are heavier than the plasma. So they end up forming a thin layer on top of the red blood cells between the two, known as the buffy coat. Our body is continu continually replacing all of our red blood cells and our white blood cells in a process called hemopoiesis. This happens in two places in our body. In the red bone marrow, which produces all the types, and then in the lymphatic tissue, which only produces a type of white blood cell called lymphocytes. Do you guys remember where red bone marrow is found in the adult body? The red bone marrow is found in the ends of long bones, in the sternum, the pelvis, cranial bones, and the vertebrae. The lymphatic tissue is found in the spleen, in the lymph nodes, in the thymus gland, which we learned about in the last chapter. Ultimately, every blood cell, whether it's red, white, or platelet, it begins as a stem cell. It then specializes into its specific blast cell, or the offspring, and then it eventually further develops into its specific blood cell. Please familiarize yourself with all of these generations from stem cell to blast cell to the very specialized cells that are found in your book on page 254. Red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes, kind of look like a frisbee golf disc. They have no organelles, no nucleus, also no mitochondria, and therefore no DNA. So they cannot replicate themselves alone. 
They have to be produced elsewhere. They are also squishy and flexible and are able to stretch and bend and squeeze through the tight vessels like our tiny capillaries. Their primary job is to deliver oxygen to all of the tissues and then remove carbon dioxide from that tish those tissues through respiration. So being able to get into those tiniest areas is what allows these red blood cells to deliver that oxygen and reach every single piece of tissue. Going deeper into the erythrocyte, a third of it is filled with hemoglobin, this funky looking structure on the slide. Each red blood cell will have 200 to 300 million molecules of hemoglobin. This is where the oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules attach when they are traveling around within the red blood cell. Hemoglobin is what actually gives blood its red color. Globins, the ribbon-like parts, they come in fours per hemoglobin molecule. Also coming in fours are the iron-containing hemistructures. One oxygen binds to one hemi, so if we have four per hemoglobin, each hemoglobin can carry four oxygen molecules. When oxygen is bound, it's called oxyhemoglobin. When the hemoglobin is transporting CO2 or carbon dioxide, one CO2 molecule will bind with one globin molecule, therefore carrying four CO2s per hemoglobin. How much oxygen the blood can carry depends on the quantity of red blood cells and the amount of hemoglobin that each cell contains. When CO2 is bound to a hemoglobin, it actually has a special name as well, and it's called a carb amino hemoglobin. Let's talk about when and how red blood cells are produced and then how they die and break down. Erythropoiesis is the process of red blood cell production. It all begins with a decrease in O2 being delivered to the tissues. This decrease in O2 can result from ascending to high altitude or pulmonary conditions smoking cigarettes, uh, COVID-19, pretty much anything that prevents O2 from perfusing well into the lungs and the body. This stimulates the kidneys to release a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO. EPO can be manufactured exogenously, which means outside of the body, and people can inject themselves with it to stimulate more red blood cell production. But endogenously, meaning within the body, this is how it happens. EPO then stimulates bone marrow to begin the process of creating new erythrocytes. Stem cells become reticulocytes and are then released into the blood. Those reticulocytes mature over the next couple of days into full-grown erythrocytes that contain their hemoglobin and then can carry more oxygen. This increase in red blood cells in the blood is the negative feedback that makes the kidneys stop releasing EPO. These red blood cells live for about 120 days, delivering oxygen and carbon dioxide to their respective areas. And as they get older, the membrane of the erythrocyte weakens, and this cell will make its way to the liver and the spleen. Macrophages, which are the chompers that eat up dying cells, 
they ingest these old red blood cells and then destroy them. The hemi and the globin are also separated and broken down into further parts. Globin breaks down into amino acids that are then recycled to create new proteins. And the hemi is broken down into iron and bilirubin. Iron is then taken up by the bones and recycled to produce new red blood cells and the bilirubin makes its way through the intestines and is excreted out of our body in our feces and our urine. White blood cells, also known as leukocytes, are the body's line of defense against bacteria, allergens, viruses, and other infectious pathogens. They are the fewest of all the formed elements in the body, but they play a very important role. Leukocytes can be categorized into two groups. Granulocytes, which have small particle, particles that look like granules of sand in them, and then agranulocytes that have no granules. Unlike red blood cells, white blood cells contain a nucleus. The nucleus of the granulocytes have multiple lobes and the nucleus of the agranulocytes looks like pretty much any other nucleus in any other cell. Of the granulocytes, there are three types. Neutrophils, which are the most abundant white blood cell, they're typically the first on scene of an invasion and primarily engulf the foreign material. Eosinophils are numerous in the respiratory and digestive tracts, and they are involved in fighting allergic reactions. Basophils, which are the fewest of the white blood cells, they secrete an anticoagulant called heparin to prevent clotting in infected areas, and they also secrete histamine, which causes vasodilation. This keeps the pathway clear for other white blood cells to do their job. Of the agranulocytes, there are two types, lymphocytes and monocytes. The lymphocytes are responsible for long-term immunity, such as your immunity to chickenpox once you've had it. T lymphocytes attack infected and cancerous cells and B lymphocytes produce the antibodies that help fight that infection if it comes around a second time. Monocytes are very large white blood cells that eventually mature into the tissue or mature in tissue into macrophages, which can then eat bacteria and viral cells to destroy them. You guys remember this process is called phagocytosis. And monocytes that become macrophages are the ones that perform phagocytosis. The last of the formed elements is the platelets, also known as thrombocytes. The job of the platelets is hemostasis, or basically stopping bleeding by blood clotting. Megakaryocytes, another cell in the bone marrow, they break off their edges to form cell fragments. And these fragments are actually what become platelets. Platelets only survive about seven days. Quiz question. A move to high altitude would trigger which change in the body? If you guessed A, you are correct. An increase in reticulocytes means that more red blood cells are about to mature. And that is what increases our oxygen carrying capacity 
to therefore adapt to higher altitudes. Let's talk about blood clots. When a blood vessel is cut, the body must react quickly to stop the flow of blood. It does so through first a vascular spasm, then second, a formation of a platelet plug, and then third, the formation of a full-on blood clot. Along the inside of your blood vessels are layers or is a layer of smooth muscle. This is what allows it to constrict and dilate. If a blood vessel is injured, this smooth muscle will do this first step of hemostasis and will spasm, which constricts the blood flow to that wounded area. The second step of hemostasis is the platelet plug, and it goes like this. The collagen fibers of the vessel wall are torn from the injury. This creates a rough spot in the wall where it is normally smooth. The platelets floating by end up sticking to that rough spot and then start to secrete a chemical that attracts even more platelets. Eventually, they all start to collect there and then develop basically a plug for that hole. This is the platelet plug and it forms the initial seal to stop the bleeding. Then comes the final step, the formation of a blood clot. Many, many chemical reactions occur between specific proteins called clotting factors that balance out the clotting against the anti-clotting to then develop the perfect final seal on the wound. This is the process of coagulation. Coagulation can be initiated extrinsically or intrinsically but the cascade eventually ends by activating a clotting factor called factor 10. Factor 10 initiates a cascade of events starting with the release of an enzyme called prothrombin activator. Prothrombin activator activates prothrombin and then prothrombin activates thrombin. And then eventually thrombin transforms the plasma protein fibrinogen into fibrin. Sticky fibrin threads form a web at the site of the injury. The red blood cells and platelets following, sorry, flowing through the web become ensnared, creating a clot of fibrin blood cells, and platelets. Blood clots eventually seal <clears throat> breaks in smaller vessels, but blood clotting alone cannot stop a large hemorrhage. So the book simplifies this process into these steps. And this is basically what you'll be expected to know, but understand that this is quite a bit more complex in our bodies. So let's review that. <clears throat> It starts with either external or internal bleeding. So a vessel gets cut, cut, and that leads to a vascular spasm, then a platelet plug, and then the blood clot formation going from factor one to factor 10. Then you go through the process of prothrombin activator to prothrombin to thrombin to fibrinogen to fibrin and fibrin actually produces the actual clot at the injury site. So this process of blood clotting doesn't just stop once the clot is formed. Eventually the clot needs to dissolve as the vessel wall heals. To do this, the platelets continually contract, pulling the torn ends of the vessel wall closer and closer together. Eventually, a similar chain of reactions to clot formation occurs, which leads to the plasma protein plasminogen being transformed into plasmin. Plasmin are like little scissors that cut up the fibrin network 
in a process called fibrinolysis. And this is actually what dissolves the blood clot. The only time we want blood clots to form in our vessels are when a repair is needed. In the meantime, our body prevents clots in a few ways. The endothelium of the blood vessels are really smooth. Therefore, it prevents platelet adhesion and our basophils secrete heparin, which counteracts the enzyme thrombin and the clot formation process. Also, Muscle contraction, movement, and a steady heartbeat keep blood flowing through these vessels. Prolonged sitting or lying down can lead to blood pooling in the legs, which allows thrombin to accumulate and a clot to form. This is why patients in hospitals post-surgery will wear compression socks to keep what is called a deep vein thrombosis from forming. It is also very crucial for someone who has a deficiency in their anti-clotting factors to avoid prolonged sitting or wear compression socks themselves. This is mostly a concern for older adults and for sick individuals or folks who are just post-surgery and sedentary. If a deep vein thrombosis forms, a piece can break off into the bloodstream called an embolism. This is basically a blood clot floating around to your vascular system. And this could be dangerous because it could eventually make it through the heart and into the pulmonary circulation and cause what's called a pulmonary embolism or PE. Quiz question. What is the first step in hemostasis? If you picked D, vascular spasm, you are correct. Basically, every other answer occurs after this vascular spasm. If you've ever donated blood, you would have figured out what your blood type is. You can be a blood type A, type B, type AB, or type O. Say you were in need of blood from an injury or illness where you lost a lot. You would need to receive blood from a donor that has the same type as you. Here's why. On the surface of the red blood cells are proteins called antigens. And floating in our plasma are antibodies that fight these antigens. If you are type A, your red blood cell will have the A antigen, but we would have the B antibody in your plasma. If you are a blood type B, your red blood cell would have B antigens, but your plasma would have the opposite and have the A antibodies. Now, if you are blood type AB, you will have both a and B antigens on your red blood cell, but you will have no antibodies in your plasma. And then if you were type O, you would have no antigens on your red blood cell, but you will have both A and B antibodies in your plasma. Re-listen to this to make sure it makes sense. The antibodies in your plasma will fight against the coinciding antigens on the red blood cell. That is why if you are type A with A antigens, you will have B antibodies in your plasma, not A antibodies. Basically, A antibodies fight A antigens and B antibodies fight B antigens. Transfusions of blood are only successful as long as the recipient's plasma 
does not contain the antibodies against the antigen on the red blood cell of the donor. Otherwise, they will attack the donor's red blood cells, causing what's called a transfusion reaction. In this case, the recipient antibody will attack the antigen on the donor cell, causing the red blood cells to clump together and eventually burst. This is called hemolysis. Now, if this happens, the red blood cell will lose its hemoglobin into the bloodstream, block tubules to the kidneys, and possibly cause renal failure. It's bad news. Now, when a hospital performs a blood transfusion, they will separate the red blood cells from the plasma on the donor blood. So basically, the recipient is only getting the formed elements in the blood. But it is possible for traces of that plasma to still remain. So what could happen, think about this, if the donor's plasma has the antibodies that would fight with the recipient's antigens? Basically, a transfusion reaction would also occur in this situation. The transfusions are risky if you don't have the exact blood type the recipient needs. Hospitals will take a sample of the recipient's blood and a sample of the donor's blood and perform the transfusion in the lab first to see if any reactions occur before they put it into the person's body. This is called cross-matching and usually or almost always is successful. There is one more thing that distinguishes blood types in addition to the antigens and antibodies of A, B, and O. This is the RH group. You can be RH positive or RH negative. What this means is if you are RH positive, you have the RH antigen in your blood. If you are RH negative, your blood does not have any of that antigen. Again, having the right RH group in a blood transfusion is also important. Here's why. Your blood does not normally contain RH antibodies, so it doesn't have anything to fight against the antigens. So if someone with RH negative blood receives RH positive blood, they then will develop the RH antibodies after being exposed. This is our immune system working here. Now, if this person receives, say, another dose of RH positive blood, then their body will actually attack the RH antigens because they have now developed those antibodies from the first receive. A transfusion reaction will occur the same process as before, which is called agglutination, and it leads to a negative outcome. Someone with RH positive blood, however, can receive RH negative blood. Why do you think that is? Because RH negative blood has no antigens, the RH positive person, the receiver, receiving that negative blood will have no reason to produce antibodies. A second instance exists when the RH group can become a problem. Say a mother who is RH negative, whose mate is RH positive, becomes pregnant with a baby that ends up having RH positive blood. Basically, mom is negative, baby is positive. During pregnancy, no mixing of the baby's and the mother's blood happens. However, during delivery or a miscarriage, the, mix the mixing does often occur. So this will then introduce the RH antigens of the, of the baby into the mother's Rh negative blood. 
what will happen now in the mother with this introduction of the Rh positive antigens? Basically, Rh antibodies will then form inside the mother's blood. So the mother's body forms the Rh antibodies to fight off the Rh positive antigens if she ever comes encountered with them again. So in this scenario, let's say this mother gets pregnant again and the fetus is again Rh positive. Well, the mother's Rh antibodies can actually pass through the placenta even if her red blood cells can't. So this actually causes an attack on the fetus's red blood cells, causing that agglutination and hemolysis of the red blood cells. The fetus will develop severe anemia called erythroblastosis vitalis. Not good. To save this fetus, an intrauterine blood transfusion must occur, and you can only imagine how risky that might be. Mothers, however, can be treated prior to pregnancy if this is a possibility to prevent her from forming the Rh antibodies. Typically, when some, a woman becomes pregnant, the Rh test is performed at the beginning of pregnancy and medication can be taken to prevent this if it is an option. All right, we'll conclude with our last quiz question. What substance carried by each red blood cell determines your blood type? The answer is B, the antigen, which is what's pre present on your red blood cell, and that's what determines your blood type. So this concludes this lecture. Thanks for sticking with me and I will talk to you next time.